On the stage, uh, we have the three Arctic ambassadors of Japan, uh, Korea, and China. And uh, over the years, uh, when the Arctic Circle has held its assemblies and forums, uh, the Arctic ambassadors of these three uh, distinguished countries uh, have played, uh, and their predecessors, significant role in the evolution of the Arctic uh, dialogue. So we decided to take the opportunity, since they were all here, the three of them, to, uh, to invite them on the stage uh, together with uh, us uh, from the Sastakawa Peace Foundation on the Arctic Circle hosting the dialogue uh, in order to uh, uh, both listen to their messages and also to pick their brains. So let me emphasize from the very beginning that after they have made their opening uh, remarks, uh, the floor will be open for questions from uh, all of you. And of course, if you are too polite or hesitant to put questions, we will make sure they get some questions. But of course, it's mainly up to you, uh, according to the uh, democratic <coughs> structure of the Arctic Circle uh, dialogue. But let me thank the three of you, for, first of all, for being here. Uh, it would be very difficult to host a meaningful uh, forum on the role of Asia in the future of the Arctic without the three of you being here, in fact, and joining the discussion. And as we have heard uh, already today uh, from various distinguished representatives of Japan, the, uh, the contribution that uh, Japan, and we know from other venues, uh, also Korea and China, to the uh, the capabilities of doing research and engaging in the Arctic is growing very fast, very fast. So that means as we look towards the future, the technical capabilities provided by the uh, leading Asian countries is, uh, is formidable uh, as we plan and uh, look forward to the growing Arctic uh, uh, engagement. And as the Arctic evolves, so will the world evolve. It's impossible to understand the future of the global climate without understanding the future of, uh, of the Arctic. So this is in fact a global issue and global concern, although we call it Arctic research and Arctic issues. It's to some extent a mis misnomer because it indicates it's just of relevance to a uh, region in the world, but of course a very big region. I often point out to people if you add up all the Arctic territories on the oceans, it's similar in size to the African to the African continent. So let me hand it over to my friend from the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, and then uh, we take it from there. Thank you. So uh, President uh, Grimson gave me a right to give a first question. Uh, and then after all, all, you know, the question from audience is coming, I, I'm expecting. And uh, my first and last question <laughs> is uh, uh, how each individual country from uh, Japan, China, and Korea have a view of Arctic and also uh, what kind of uh, Arctic policy uh, from each individual country. So uh, Ambassador Takiwaka, could you please start the answer? Um, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Grimson and uh, Mr. Sakaguchi, uh, for this opportunity. It's an honor to be the uh, first speaker. Um, I understand that this is a dialogue of the Arctic. Well, dialogue, you know, not of the three countries, but dialogue with the audience. So let us, you know, talk, you know, uh, you know uh, to our audience. Um, we feel that the Arctic has been severely, severely affected by the climate change. The uh, Arctic, it is rapidly warming uh, three times or more than three times uh, than the average of the rest of the world. So it is, it is 
uh, necessary to maintain observation and research of the Arctic in order to help improve our knowledge for climate change response sus and thus um, beneficial uh, for all mankind. Um, last uh, December, uh, Japan decided national security strategy. And in this strategy, we uh, stated that climate change is a security issue that, that affects the very existence of humankind. Um, compared uh, with the pre-version uh, pre of the national uh, security strategy, the, the emphasis uh, of climate change has been uh, strengthened. Um, the basic plan on ocean policy, uh, which covers the Arctic policy, was formulated in 2018. And uh, the first Japan's Arctic policy was for, uh, presented in uh, 2015. Um, in our Arctic policy, uh, we have three main pillars, uh, research and development, uh, international cooperation, and sustainable uh, use. As, in the, uh, as is uh, stated in the opening session, uh, we are going to uh, revise this uh, basic uh, plan on o ocean policy uh, in the coming months, uh, including the policy. The Japanese government uh, will put in service its first ice-breaking Arctic research ship in schedule in 2026. We would like to provide it as an uh, international uh, platform uh, for observation. Um, we, are, we don't have a name yet, but uh, well, the concept is uh, it is an international platform ship for Arctic research. Um, so it, it is intended uh, to be a, a joint research and monitoring and uh, collaborating with the uh, uh, program with uh, participating uh, countries. We see the uh, science, uh, particularly in the Arctic, is a, a global matter. I stop here. Thank you very much. And uh, what about uh, uh, Ambassador Gao? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, I'm honored to uh, uh, take this opportunity to, uh, uh, in five minutes, to try to spell out our Arctic policy. Uh, actually, uh, China has published its uh, first white paper on the uh, on China's Arctic policy. Uh, I hope people still remember that. Uh, that was five years ago. Uh, 2018, January, uh, our first Arctic policy white paper was issued. So this white paper continued to guide our, all the, our activities in the uh, Arctic. Um, this document is still uh, available on the, on the web, so everybody can take another look uh, of the white paper. I just, in the, in the five minutes, I just want to mention uh, four uh, policy goals uh, in, the, in the white paper, and that is understanding the Arctic, uh, protection of the Arctic, uh, sustainable use of the Arctic as well as the participation of uh, the uh, governance of the Arctic. So these four policy goals uh, continue to guide our activities in the Arctic. Um, I would say that understanding of the Arctic is the prerequisite for everything. 
uh, for our activity in the Arctic. So we can do nothing uh, without uh, understanding of the Arctic. It's continued to, it's, it's uh, increasingly true uh, today uh, because we, uh, the more we learn about Arctic, we found that we continued <laughs> Uh, to uh, need, there is a continued uh, need for us to learn more about the Arctic, and uh, the global challenges uh, still need a lot of uh, efforts in that regard. And then, second comes uh, protection. Uh, we put protection of the Arctic in the second place. I think that is. Uh, uh, very important for us to remember that uh, anything you do in the Arctic uh, that you can not uh, forget that uh, you should uh, do it uh, without uh, uh, you know any any careless action uh, in the Arctic. Uh, uh, the third, uh, sustainable use of the Arctic. Uh, is a broader sense, uh, including the tourism. I, I heard that uh, uh, the statement made by our <laughs> re re uh, other parts uh, in uh, 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 the people in the, uh, living in the Arctic uh, now uh, trying to remember the good days when the tourism uh, tourists are coming <laughs> can come back after the three-year uh, pandemic. Uh, so uh, uh, tourism is one form of uh, usage, uh, sustainable use of, uh, of the Arctic. There are other forms of uh, the uh, uh, sustainable use of uh, uh, Arctic. And uh, China, Japan, and, and Korea were also party to uh, the fishery agreement. So that's another uh, area where we can uh, uh, work on uh, on the sustainable use of uh, not yet use, but uh, trying to understand more about the Arctic. So uh, the fourth is the participation of the uh, governance of uh, the um, uh, of the Arctic. So there, uh, we we don't have the time, but um, uh, just like uh, the uh, October last year in uh, Reykjavik. We talk about uh, how do we see uh, the future of the Arctic Council. Um, I still, um, uh, I am still of the view that uh, we need uh, the uh, continuation uh, in whatever form. We uh, we can agree that the continuation of the work of the Arctic Council and uh, all its working groups and the task forces. So this is the sustain sustainability of the Arctic is a long-term ulti ultimate goal of the people uh, under the Arctic in the future. So that is continue to be the ultimate goal of the people there. So we will continue to work uh, for that purpose, on that purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Gao. And uh, now, uh, I would like to ask uh, Ambassador Hong about uh, your scope based on your country's uh, policies for Arctic. Thank you, and uh, also I'm glad to be here with our uh, uh, dear colleagues and uh, Chairman Grimson and uh, uh, Korea and Japan and China joined the Arctic Council as observers with the same year in 2013. And uh, now we found out that there are lots of similarities in our own goals and pol Arctic policies such as uh, nowadays, actually, environmental protection, especially fighting climate crisis, is actually primary goal of every country. It belongs to, in a sense, the Arctic region, but also it goes beyond the Arctic region as well. As previously repeated by many uh, researchers and the prominent uh, policy makers, uh, the temperature in the Arctic region is going four times faster than its global average. And uh, we have responsibility, not just the Arctic state, but all Arctic state responsibilities. In this sense, actually, Korea, Japan, and China has a similar goal in their Arctic policies, protecting the environment, fighting climate changes. And also, we have similarities in our, because we are going to, Korea is going to contribute to Arctic Council 
and also to other organization through scientific researches. Korean government has invested a lot in our researchers and uh, we also have our own uh, icebreakers. We are going to build our second icebreakers research ships and we have a uh, sizable resources and manpower to contribute uh, in terms of scientific research in the Arctic uh, region. And thirdly, uh, 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 Korean government is also trying to find out new possibilities in the Arctic region, economic ones. But it doesn't mean you are going to extract resources from the Arctic region at all. Uh, but it's more closely related to the renewable energies. Nowadays, green shipping is actually a big issue everywhere. And uh, green shipping is also very important to preserve environment in the Arctic region because you know that black carbon produced by uh, uh, gasolines and diesel engines are actually, in a sense, polluting the Arctic region and also accelerating uh, melting of the ice. If you can introduce, uh, by, in a sense, uh, uh, test site, some kind of uh, ship uh, driven by electricity or hydrogen or ammonia, it will make big positive impact. So Korean Arctic policy is based on a knowledge-based science uh, approach and trying to contribute to the international community. Nowadays, young people, uh, young population in Korean, uh, Korea are very much concerned about, much more concerned to the environmental change than older generations. In this sense, I think we are in the right direction. And uh, finally, I wish to mention that uh, one more example of uh, uh, Korea's contribution to international cooperation. It's uh, uh, my friend, Ambassador Gao Pang, mentioned that Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement. It's a very unique setting because uh, it includes uh, Arctic coastal states, also non Arctic coastal states participate equal footing. Five Arctic coastal states, such as uh, uh, Norway, uh, uh, Norway, Russia, and EU, uh, Norway, Russia, Canada, Denmark, and the uh, uh, US is participating, but at the same time, representing non uh, Arctic coastal states, Korea, Japan, and uh, China, and uh, EU and uh, Iceland are participating. And uh, it's, uh, it will make a good example of uh, global cooperation to sustainably maintain. Arctic surroundings, also uh, explore possible way of uh, commercial fishing in the long-term future on the sustainable basis. And uh, Korea, last year, Korea hosted the first conference of parties of Kaupa in Incheon, Korea. And this uh, June, we are going to host the second meeting, in-person meeting in Korea as well. Through uh, this kind of a multilateral fora, Korea is ready to cooper, contribute uh, and facilitate international cooperation. Thank you. S thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Hon. Uh, so far, uh, not only me, but also uh, all of us uh, found out uh, lots of lots of you know, common uh, topics uh, among uh, three countries. Uh, one is uh, uh, nature conservation and also sustainability and also uh, international uh, cooperation for, for fisheries. And uh, just within uh, 15 minutes, five minutes each, we, we found out uh, lots of lots of you know, common topics to work together. So uh, now we found out the necessity, you know, the collaboration, not only three countries, but also more and more you know, global uh, collaboration to pursue the real you know, importance of the Arctic. So I will return to uh, German uh, Grimson uh, for your <coughs> next uh, session. Yes. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, <coughs> I think it is also worth pointing out that uh, in the light of what uh, the ambassador of Korea mentioned, uh, the recent COP meeting on the quite remarkable historic uh, Arctic Ocean Treaty uh, which I believe is one of the most interesting international agreements to be made in the last uh, last 10 years, where not only the three countries who are represented here on the States, but the European Union, uh, 
United States, uh, Russia, a number of uh, other Arctic states came together in an agreement to preserve uh, the Central Arctic Ocean, uh, which uh, is opening up uh, rapidly, the first time in human history that a new ocean uh, appears, uh, appears on the planet. Not very many people realize that, that uh, this is the first time in human history that a new ocean appears on the planet. And uh, the fact that uh, your three states, Japan, Korea, and China, have joined the rest of us in preserving that ocean is quite, quite remarkable and important. So, now the floor is open. I believe there are, are supposed to be microphones somewhere here in the hall, yes. Uh, so you have to put up your hand. Yes, there's one question there. And uh, we will start there, and then we will move here to the center and then to the front. Let's take two or three questions in the beginning, yes. You int introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, Mark Lantain, University of Tromsø, Arctic University of Norway. Um, thank you very much, all of you. Just two very quick questions. First of all, in light of the precarious situation of the Arctic Council, uh, this has been a focus of discussion for quite some time. Uh, how do you see each of your respective countries responding to the uncertain situation with that organization? If it is not able to function as it was before, if there need to be changes, how do you see uh, each of your respective governments uh, potentially altering their Arctic policies because of this? And the second very quick question is, uh, for the past few years, there have been uh, trilateral meetings between your respective countries. And how do you see those uh, progressing forward? What topics do you think are most important in regards to Northeast Asia Arctic cooperation? Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, uh, my name is Rasmus Bertelsen. I'm a colleague of Mark Lantenia at the Arctic University of Norway and also a Nansen professor at the University of Akureyri. Um, my question is, uh, the three countries we have represented here, I mean, we have two of the world's three largest economies, and South Korea is also a, a very highly developed major economy. And East Asia is very much key to, how to say, world peace. Um, so, so your relations, your bilateral relations, and of course cross-Taiwan Strait relations are very much key to world peace um, and economic development, et cetera, et cetera. So my question is, how do your trilateral relations affect the Arctic, and how does the Arctic affect your trilateral relations? Thank you very much. Okay, behind you, I think I, my questions are also related to uh, the previous uh, two peoples. After the, uh, I am, I am Chisako Maso from Kyushu University. After the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, the international tension has uh, increased in many places in the world. Um, uh, and some worry about resecuritization of the Arctic region. We don't know how to deal with Russia in coming years in, on the related affairs. Now, I would like to ask, what is your plan to overcome uh, this challenge, and uh, whom do you plan to cooperate particularly to achieve your goals? Thank you. So let's take uh, one final question from this side here. There was a hand. Yes, here. Yeah, far hand. Hello, my name is uh, Sigmund Isfeld. I represent the government of the Faroe Islands. Uh, this is not so much a question as a, a very positively meant uh, outreach, that uh, when you mention uh, the five coastal states in the Nordic area uh, regarding cooperation uh, uh, of science, research, and, and uh, such, uh, the Faroe Islands uh, actually have uh, built, uh, uh, not an icebreaker, but a very new uh, and very capable uh, research vessel. And when it comes to research, uh, oceanographic research, climate research, marine biology, uh, also uh, regulating of fisheries, uh, all kinds of economic activity, uh, it's actually the government of the Faroe Islands that is the coastal state. So just a reminder and a well-meant uh, uh, outreach 
So uh, I think it's very important that we are open and and uh, and uh, and um, uh, at least our government is very open for for uh, cooperation with uh, all of these uh, Arctic uh, uh, Asian states that you represent. Thank you. Okay, so <coughs> we we can do this we can do this two ways. Uh, one way is we continue with the questions until the time is up and you don't get any answers. <laughs> Which actually might be an interesting innovation, since there are so many questions. We just take the questions, and then you have to come back next year for the answer. <laughs> uh, so maybe we do that. There, there were a number of hands at the back. So let's hear the questions. Then the, the three of you have to choose later on what, which one you want to answer. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah, you have okay. to introduce yeah, yourself. Thank you. Yes, uh, Zia Madani uh, from Kobe University Polar Cooperation Research Center, PCRC. Uh, thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, session. Uh, my question pertains to uh, how or to what extent uh, this dialogue or initiative is going to be inclusive. Is this dialogue or initiative uh, is intended to include uh, more countries uh, from uh, Asia? Uh, from other locations of Asia, uh, at least those uh, that have expressed uh, willingness and um, intention uh, to be, uh, or, or, or the other stakeholders. Is this something that you might envision? Thank you. There were a few other hands at the back. I think uh, uh, maybe they have decided not to put the question. So, Okay, so you've got a lot to choose from. And since all three of you are trained diplomats, I'm sure you can select the ones you want to answer. So let me start here. Yeah. Okay. I manage all of the questions except for one, one exceptions, and uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I cannot say why, but uh, but okay. Uh, about the first question regarding to trilateral cooperation, I think there is uh, ample space for our three countries to resume our cooperation because. Uh, 2015, uh, our leaders of three countries met together and decided to launch this kind of trilateral Arctic cooperation. So far, we had four rounds of uh, uh, trilateral meetings up to 2019. The pandemic just stopped all these activities, but I'm pretty sure that we can manage to resume our trilateral meetings sooner or later because uh, it's not political, it's, and uh, it has, uh, we have, uh, I think, three countries on the same ground on this issue because uh, uh, regarding scientific cooperation, and uh, we three countries have the facilities and energies and resources, and uh, uh, luckily all of us by the, are going to have uh, icebreakers research vessels as well. So uh, uh, sharing our own experience of operating icebreakers and uh, uh, sharing our information gathered, collected from our own scientific researches, there are ample room of cooperation. I'm pretty sure that uh, either sooner or later we can resume these trilateral cooperations. And about the second question, uh, two of uh, from audience made, uh, in a sense, mentioned the similar questions on the future of Arctic Council, and uh, yes, uh, for the couple of years, uh, one of the in a few years, uh, how can I say? But the Arctic Council's activity was partially, just partially suspended. It's official line. And <laughs> but everybody wants to resume the activity of the Arctic Council. It's too important, very much important, Arctic Council to continue its missions. And uh, uh, we observer countries are ready to support, support any initiative from Arctic Councils, and uh, this year uh, Norway is going to take over the chairmanship, and uh, we are very much ready to be supportive of a new chairmanship and any kind of Arctic Councils activities through uh, working groups, any, any, any other means. And uh, another issue uh, I briefly like to mention is that, yes, the Arctic Council is a main player regarding uh, Arctic issues, but observers have responsibilities and also uh, ability to contribute as well. And uh, we already mentioned that Arctic 
region is the frontier of the climate crisis. And the climate crisis affects everybody. And uh, I think we three countries have to contribute more in this regard, uh, fighting climate crisis. I'm going to stop you there because the clock is ticking. Yes. Yes, no, yes. Go on. Thank you, uh, Mr. Crimson. Uh, Yes, on the, on the trilateral cooperation, I, I think I don't have much to, to add to what uh, Ambassador Hong has just said. I, I totally agree that this is the time to resume our trilateral high-level dialogue uh, interrupted by the, by, by the three-year uh, pandemic. Uh, this is the time for us to start it. Uh, on the um, uh, Arctic Council uh, continuation, I think I don't need to repeat <laughs> what I have already said in uh, Reykjavik. Uh, in my view, uh, the Arctic Council, uh, composed of eight Arctic states, uh, have been making uh, decisions uh, on the basis of consensus. So legally, without uh, uh, Rush, Russian Federation as part of the decision making, it will be extremely difficult to take any formal um, uh, decision by the, Arct uh, by the Arctic Council. I'm happy to, uh, to learn that uh, uh, Norway uh, is now planning, maybe it's already doing, uh, something that to, to, to find ways to uh, allow uh, the Russian Federation to come back to the decision making uh, in some uh, some good way, acceptable way uh, to all. I think that's moving in a, in a, in a very good uh, direction, so that we can see that Norway can take the responsibility of the chairmanship uh, formally, based on a decision made by consensus, so that we can resume the operation of Arctic Council so that we can continue to be <laughs> observers. Uh, all of us are observers to the Arctic Council so we can continue to cooperate in the framework of the Arctic Council working groups, task forces. We can continue to do that, to join our hands in, in that in very important uh, efforts. Uh, okay. On, okay, sorry. Uh, Ambassador Tucker. Time is up for me? Ye well, if it's for all of us. I mean, basically, I mean, as you can see. Yes, Ambassador Tucker. Yes. All right. And the uh, uh, relations between uh, three countries and Arctic, uh, I can simply say that we are, the, we are simply observers. And uh, for the Arct um, Ukraine, um, Russia's aggression against Ukraine represents a serious challenge both in Europe, in Asia, and this is a very important historical juncture, and Japan is assuming G7 uh, presidency uh, in order to lead initiatives uh, to lead, uh, pursue the peace and prosperity of the world. Any unilateral attempt to change the status quo by force is not acceptable anywhere in the world, and we need a strong determination uh, to uphold international order based on rule of law and to realize free and open Indo-Pacific. And we believe that such a vision is also buried in the Arctic. Um, and we value uh, Arctic Council presidency transition to Norway in May. And as an observer state in Asia, uh, we need to confirm our position that a Arctic Council will continue to be important. And I appreciate the question about the inclusiveness. Um, it, at this historical juncture, as we have uh, some small modification that maybe our framework might be upgraded to include more you know, Asian countries because Asia has more population growth and more, uh, more economic growth, uh, which is a potential of more emissions. That's why we advocate uh, Asia Zero Emission Committee. Thank you. Well, we have five seconds <coughs> left. 
Let me just uh, thank you for your contributions and point out that in the previous panel, we had the distinguished representative of India and Singapore. And with these three uh, ambassadors here, we have heard from all the five op Asian observer states in the Arctic Council. And the Arctic Circle is, uh, is very proud of uh, being able in cooperation with the Sosakawa Peace Foundation to provide this presentation of the Asian five observer states in the Arctic Council. But I sometimes say to my good friend, Carl Bildt, who was the chair of the Arctic Council in Kiruna 10 years ago, as foreign minister of Sweden, and John Kerry, the US Secretary of State at that time, who also attended it, when all these five countries were accepted as observer states. If anyone would have predicted at that meeting in Kiruna in 2013, that within a decade, these five Asian countries would play such an important role in Arctic dialogue, Arctic research, uh, Arctic evolution. I don't think anyone would have, would have believed that. So I think we have here in the last hour or so been witness to, uh, to observe the extraordinary transformation of what my good friend Lasse Heinen, who is here somewhere in the hall, professor from Finland, called 10 years ago the global Arctic, which everybody found a strange term at that time. But in the last hour, I think we have seen a formidable demonstration of this appropriate term, uh, the global Arctic. And with that, I thank you all uh, for your participation in the panel, and we will go straight to the next session. Thank you.